I'm a coast to coast trucker, or at least I was. I've crisscrossed this country so many times over the years, I started to feel like I knew the land like the back of my hand. I thought I'd seen just about everything, but I was wrong. Something happened on my last route that makes me feel like I'm either going crazy or I saw something that stands as a warning sign for all of us, not just truckers, but anyone who lives on this continent. Regardless, I'll never be able to go near that region again. I was heading east on Interstate 40 through the desert of New Mexico on my way to Richmond. I just left Oxnard the previous day with a load full of produce. A typical route for me, something I've done hundreds of times. It was the start of the second day of my journey. I left the truck stop at about 4.30 in the morning and had been driving for about an hour. It was still dark out and there was almost nobody on the road. I found myself in one of the long, flat and empty stretches in the middle of nowhere when I suddenly had a tire blow out. It wasn't my first time, so I knew what to do and eased the truck off the road and I came to an easy stop. I was mad about it though, as I always made sure my tires were in good condition, but unfortunately, sometimes things just happen. I put my hazards on and I got out to put reflectors on the shoulder and inspect the damage to see if it was something I could manage myself or if I would need roadside assistance. As I suspected, the tire was shredded but I had a spare and everything I needed to change it. I was just about to lose a few hours of time. That and the night wind was blowing hard and cold. On second thought, I decided that even though I had a big magnetic flashlight, I should just wait for sunrise since it wasn't far off. While I was waiting, I figured I'd have a few cigarettes to calm myself down. I opened my passenger side door to block the wind and I sat up on the step just looking out at the big dark emptiness and all the stars while I blew smoke at it. It was quiet, immensely quiet. I went through several cigarettes, and when I was done, I just flicked the butts into the scrubland. Admittedly, that was an irresponsible thing to do, but I got my comeuppance. A huge gust of wind came and slammed the door shut right on me. I didn't have time to get out of the way, so I got smacked right in the face. What's worse, I had a lit cigarette in my hand as I tried to stop the door and shield my face, but it just got pushed into my lips and gave me a nasty burn. I shoved the door off of me and I stumbled onto the shoulder, kicking and cursing the pain away, thinking this trip was starting off pretty terribly. Then another cold blast of wind came from the northeast, seemingly just to add insult to injury. I turned to shake my fist at it for my lack of anything else I could do when I saw something on the horizon. It looked like a person, but they were glowing. Otherwise, there's no way I would have been able to see them in the darkness. The sight of them gave me chills on its own. They were standing at the apex of the slight incline I was on, maybe a mile or two away. They were small, but I could still make it out when I squinted. They were actually standing in the middle of the road. I looked on as they raised their hand into the air. They were holding something up like it was a spear. Then, gradually, more people started showing up behind him and either side of him, coming to stand with him at the top of the rise, all glowing the same impossible glow, and they were all waving objects in the air. There must have been 30 or 40 of them in all. Finally, it became obvious that they were threatening me with their weapons, spears, axes, and bows. In this moment, I felt frozen. An immense roar erupted from the army as they all charged forward at once. Whatever distance between us was about to be cleared in a matter of minutes. Their speed was unnatural. Supernatural, almost. Panicking, I felt the only thing I could do was climb in my cab and hide. But when I climbed up and tried to open the door, I had somehow locked myself out. And my keys were still in the cab. I kicked myself for being so dumb, but nothing was stopping this army of phantoms from running towards me. I turned back to face them, figuring if I died, I wouldn't die running or hiding. I would just face my demise head on. Within moments, they were just seconds away. They sped across the land like the wind itself, wailing battle cries and ready to tear me apart with their primitive weapons. My epiphany came in the last moments. 
These were lost souls of the Native Americans who died defending this land, which meant everything to them, but nothing to me. Just an endless expanse of dust and shrubs to pave a road across and drive through it without even stopping to appreciate it. I almost thought I deserved it. Even if I didn't do the killing or the paving, I did the driving over their graves, over and over again. No wonder why they blew out my tire, I thought. But then, God arrived with the rising sun, and as the first light of the day touched their hollow glow, they all evaporated into thin desert mist, the wispiest morning dew in existence. A gust of wind charged right through me, and I was almost swept off my feet. I stood there in awe, then watching the desert sunrise until a truck came rushing by and broke me from my trance. For the first time, at that moment, I thought to myself, what a god-awful noise that is. As a female trucker, I have to take extra precautions on the road. If I let my guard down for even a few seconds, I could end up seriously hurt, and I don't say this hypothetically. Once while I was stopped at a rest area, doing some routine checks on my vehicle, I thought I caught a glimpse of a shady-looking man wandering around the truck parking lot. I didn't think much of it because I was getting ready to leave very shortly, so after I made sure everything was good to go, I hopped into my cab and locked the doors, thinking I was safe. I took a minute or two to look through my phone and queue up a podcast before getting on the road, and then I was off. Everything was business as usual for the next few hours, and then I was ready for a fill-up. I rolled into the station and started pumping the diesel into my driver's side tank, still completely unaware that anything was amiss. But then, while I was on the other side, filling up my passenger side tank, I thought I heard the sound of my door opening and closing. I stopped fueling and checked around, even peeking my head inside to see if anyone was in there, but I didn't see anything. I shrugged it off and told myself I better be more diligent about locking my doors, even when I step out just to fill up. Then I went back to my business. After filling up, I went inside the store for a bite to eat and to use their bathroom for a number two, and I got back on the road. Everything was fine until a few miles down the highway. I felt a cold, sharp blade press against my throat and a dirty hand put my neck in a vice grip. My heart sank to the floor and suddenly I couldn't see anything but what was straight ahead. Then a man's voice spoke to me. Turn off your radio and pull over, he whispered in my ear. For the moment, until I could figure out what I could possibly do, I did as he said. Couldn't call for help from my radio, and I couldn't reach for my phone in my pocket, and it wouldn't do any good to start swerving. There was something in the cab that would help me, but I had to figure out a way to get it. I tried to think while I pulled off onto the shoulder and I put on my hazards like I was having mechanical issues. Once I parked, the man grabbed my face and forced me to look at him. That's when I realized he was a sketchy guy I saw at the last rest area. He was even grosser up close, but he was also clearly hell-bent on getting to me. He must have climbed under my cab and held on for over 200 miles, then snuck inside and hid while I was at the pump. And now that he thought he was finally going to get what he wanted, he ordered me to do as he commanded. Climb into the bunk with me and don't try anything. I need you to be alive. You just need to be warm, he said with a sickening grin. It made shivers go through my whole body and I almost threw up in his face, but I didn't. He grabbed my arm with his free hand and kept the knife close to my throat as he started to drag me up to the bunk. I knew there was a step getting into it, so while I was still a foot lower than him, I made my move. I grabbed his hand with the knife and I wrenched it away to keep him from cutting me as I plunged a foot into his groin, then yanked him by the arm to throw him over my head. At the last moment, I turned to the side and kicked him away, sending him reeling into the driver's seat floorboard while I landed in the passenger seat. Before he could get up, I opened my glove box and grabbed my 9mm, which was loaded and ready to go the second I switched off the safety. I know it's illegal, but it's the only thing that saved me this night. 
I pointed it right at him and I told him to get the hell out of my truck. He refused to drop the knife, but he put his hands up and started to climb out the door. I followed him to close the door behind him, but as I was pulling it shut, he turned around and grabbed it at the last second. I fell back into the seat, dropping the 9mm on the floorboard because I instinctively went to hold the door with both hands. We were locked in a tug of war, which I knew he might just win. That's when an interesting idea occurred to me. I let go completely and kicked the door open, then lost his grip and flew back toward the road, but he never hit the ground. The car was speeding by at that exact moment, and the attacker crashed right into the innocent bystander's windshield. It all flashed before my eyes in a split second, and I got up to watch as the car careened off the road and thankfully came to a stop without any other collisions. The attacker was minced me on impact, and the driver of the vehicle, a 20-something guy, was really shaken up. He's probably pretty traumatized, come to think of it, but when I told him that he hit a scumbag and not a regular trucker, he seemed to be okay with it. Unfortunately, I lost my whole job over this crap, and I ended up unemployed through all of the lockdown. I'm still trying to find another company to get a new transportation contract, but it's been difficult with my record. My family says I should get a job that's not trucking, something safer, but I don't think I want to let this ruin my career for me. I've been a trucker for 15 years, and I've only had this one slip up, and it didn't even have to do with trucking, it was just because some creep thought I was vulnerable. When I started out trucking, an old timer I met at Love's once told me to never tell anybody what I was hauling, no matter how valuable I did or didn't think it was. I thought he was just old and paranoid, as I'd never really heard of truck robberies being a realistic issue, but I shouldn't have taken the old man's wisdom for granted. I'd only been trucking for a few years, and I really loved doing it. Now I'm pretty much barred from trucking for the rest of my life. Unless I manage to save up enough money somehow to buy my own instead of renting under a contract. My series of errors began when I started driving through the middle of the night to avoid traffic and have a smoother ride. People always told me that was all good until I broke down at 2am in the middle of nowhere. But I discovered it leaves you more vulnerable for more than that reason alone. One night, I was taking a break at one of the sketchiest rest stops I've ever been to. It was about 3 o'clock in the morning and I needed to take a rest before going on any further, but I didn't expect this place to suck as much as it did. It almost looked abandoned, and there was barely anyone stopped there. I should have had the sense to just roll on through and take the next stop, but I didn't feel like it. I parked and pissed, and I shut my eyes for a few minutes. Then I spotted a vending machine in the building and I wanted to check it out. You know, maybe get a snack or a coffee or something. I was looking for something to buy when a man came out of the bathroom and approached me. He looked like he was in some kind of biker gang with the obvious leather jacket and the tattoos. Don't bother, he said. They're all busted. Oh, well, I don't really need any of it anyway, I said. Then the man reached into his jacket and my heart jumped for a second. But instead of pulling out a weapon, he pulled out a flask and offered it to me. This is what you really need, isn't it? He asked. Oh, no thanks, I declined. I have to get back on the road. Suit yourself. The man then shrugged and took a swig from the flask. Well then, good night, I said as I turned around and started walking back to my truck. The man didn't follow me, but he didn't accept that I wanted the conversation to be over. That's your truck out there? He hollered. I stopped and pivoted back to look. Yep, I replied. What are you hauling? He asked. At that moment, I remembered what that old timer had told me. Not to let anyone know if you've got something valuable in your trailer. I stammered for an instant, looking for a lie that would sound true. Oh, just some toilet paper. I finally hollered back. Just toilet paper, huh? The man chuckled and smirked, and just by the look on his face, I knew he could tell I was lying. That ain't worth much as it used to be, he added. 
Um, yeah, I said awkwardly, turning back around and walking back to my truck. Safe travels, then, I heard the man say over my shoulder. I climbed into my truck and got moving immediately. I had a bad feeling about this whole thing, and I knew that I might be reacting too late, but I had to get a move on either way. Because I was lying. I wasn't hauling toilet paper. I was hauling various medicines for a pharmaceutical plant, many of which would go for a lot of money on the black market. Opioids, amphetamines, or in this country, even insulin. Unfortunately, I think the speediness of me getting out of there might have given away that I was hauling something that was worth stealing. I wasn't even fully merged onto the highway before a motorcycle raced up in front of me and started brake checking me. I could tell from the jacket that it was the guy I had been talking to, but now his face was covered. He took me for the kind of guy that wouldn't hit him and risk killing him, and he was right. I slowed down, and before I knew it, I was surrounded by cars on the left side of me, pushing me onto the shoulder. I kept going, even on the rough pavement. And then for a second, I thought I might get a break. The bike in front of me moved out of the way, but then a second later, an old beat-up white van took its place and slammed on the brakes. I struck the van, and in a moment of rage, I decided to go full throttle and push the thing out of my way. However, when I looked out my driver's side window, the man on the bike was riding alongside the SUV that was blocking me in, and he was pointing a gun right at me. I panicked and jerked the steering wheel to the left, causing the SUV and the biker to flinch, but they didn't let up. Suddenly, the biker fired his gun. The bullet went over the SUV and right through the window and got lodged somewhere in the ceiling, but thankfully it missed me. Right about then, the passenger in the SUV leaned out of the window with a shotgun and fired at my front wheels, blowing it out instantly. By now, I knew I'd be killed if I didn't stop, so I finally gave up. I stopped and I put my hands up, knowing what was about to go down was not going to be pretty. In seconds, they were slamming the cab and screaming at me to open the doors, or they'd force their way in and kill me. All of them were masked, so their identities were fully concealed so I knew there was no point in trying getting a good description on any of them. I obeyed and I unlocked the doors. I was yanked out by the biker and thrown to the ground. I caught a glimpse of my dash camera being destroyed before the beating started. Several of them went at me with clubs and brass knuckles and boots. I tried to protect my head with my arms and hands, but I couldn't withstand it for very long until I went unconscious. That's the last thing I remember being beaten to an absolute pulp. I woke up in the hospital a few weeks later, with everyone around me saying they thought I wasn't going to make it. I had a broken skull, shattered orbital, missing teeth, a broken jaw, cracked ribs, a punctured lung, and internal bleeding, and a whole universe of bruises and lacerations. They say I was found in a ditch by a passerby at dawn, a whole three hours later. The doctor said if it had been another hour, I would have died from a swelling in my brain or suffocated on my own blood. It's truly a miracle that I survived. However, the police investigation never got far, unfortunately. The gang drove the truck on the flat tire into a clearing in the woods by the highway and rummaged through the cargo from cover and took everything of value, then left it there and fled. Suspects were identified based on fingerprints and my recollection of events, but the gang is still at large. They could be anywhere in the country at this point. Recovery was and continues to be a long and difficult road for me. And of course, I had to file for bankruptcy because of the medical debt. Because, yeah, I'm not paying that. 